episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service created by the founder of the Discovery Channel that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Like Adolf Hitler, The Itinerary, an immense study of Hitler's movements from childhood to the end of his life, and D-Day, Hidden Traces, that uses archaeology to uncover what was left behind in Normandy by Allied and Axis troops, from helmets to bunkers. Get unlimited access, starting at just two ninety nine a month or nineteen ninety nine a year. And for my audience, the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash Mark Felton and use the promo code Mark Felton during the sign-up process. Curiosity Stream, the best streaming service for lovers of history. This is the story of a largely forgotten Cold War conflict, the Second Korean War, that occurred between 1966 and 1969, precisely when America was mired in the Vietnam War. U.S. soldiers were killed and wounded during constant combat along the border separating North and South Korea, dramatic events hardly discussed today. Most people are familiar with the Korean War that occurred between 1950 and 1953. It was a conflict that had its roots in World War II, when Japan surrendered in August 1945, its forces still occupied much of Korea, which had been a Japanese colony since 1911. Soviet forces had occupied parts of the north in a short campaign against the Japanese, while US forces arrived in the south to disarm and repatriate the Japanese occupiers. Korea was divided into two occupation zones along the 38th parallel, in the north, the Soviets created a puppet communist state, North Korea, ruled by Kim Il-sung, while in the south, a puppet capitalist state was created by the US, led by Syngman Rhee, known as South Korea. Both nations claim to be the legitimate government of all Korea, a situation that remains to the present day. In June 1950, the North Koreans, with Soviet permission, invaded the south, conquering most of the nation, a United Nations force led by the U.S. was formed to counter North Korea, and following a brilliant amphibious invasion at Incheon led by General Douglas MacArthur, the U.N. forces broke out of the Pusan perimeter in the far south, linking up with MacArthur's landing forces, sending the North Koreans reeling back across the 38th parallel. The U.N. pursued the North Koreans to the Yalu River, the border with communist China, causing Chairman Mao Zedong to launch a huge counteroffensive to save the North Koreans. This pushed the UN forces back down to the 38th parallel and beyond, until the UN managed to push the Chinese and North Koreans back over the border. For two years, the war became a battle of attrition, the lines hardly moving, though fighting was intense. On the 27th of July 1953, an armistice was signed. The North remained communist, the South democratic, the border the 38th parallel. But a wide strip of territory along the border became a buffer zone called the Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ, or an American DMZ, to create some space between the two sides. Significant U.S. forces remained in South Korea to help the government defend the nation from further North Korean attacks. There were many cross-border incidents and shootings, but between 1966 and 1969, quite large-scale fighting broke out along the DMZ that involved thousands of U.S. troops during a difficult time for America. For during the new conflict, the U.S. was heavily committed to the war in Vietnam which stole all the limelight and all the headlines. Hardly anyone today knows about what has come to be called the Second Korean War, the forgotten conflict along the 38th parallel that came close to full-scale war. In 1962, North Korean leader Kim Il-sung proposed a new strategy, which included irregular warfare, agitation and propaganda towards the South. Then, as the Vietnam War hotted up, U.S. infantry and marine divisions were progressively transferred out of South Korea to Vietnam, leaving a much-reduced U.S. security force to back up the South Korean army. In 1966, Kim saw an opportunity. 
irregular warfare along the DMZ would be more successful now that much of the U.S. military strength had been redeployed to Vietnam. Kim hoped to cause the U.S. to give up its protection for South Korea, allowing him to foment an insurrection to remove President Park Chung-hee's administration in Seoul. In 1966, the North Korean People's Army, the NKPA, deployed eight infantry divisions along the border, with eight more in reserve, plus three motorized divisions, an armored division, and various independent brigades. In total, the NKPA had 386,000 troops within striking distance of South Korea. The U.S. had two infantry divisions, the 2nd and 7th, on the border, alongside nine South Korean divisions. Two U.S. infantry divisions stand ready to back up the South Koreans. Close to the DMZ, astride a traditional invasion route to Seoul, is our 2nd infantry division, geared for instant action. Patrols of the 2nd are daily searching the countryside for any sign of infiltrators. These patrols are in deadly earnest because infiltration is a reality and these men never know at what instant they may be brought under fire by an enemy ambush. The other U.S. division on duty, the 7th, stands by on call to move its forces wherever needed. Exacting training and discipline keep the men at the peak of readiness. Members of the South Korean Army who volunteer to serve within U.S. Army units join in the training. The two U.S. divisions were under strength due to the need to send replacements to Vietnam. They were also short of equipment. The GIs had not been issued with the new M16 rifles used in Vietnam. Instead, they still used the older M14. Available tanks were older M48 A2C patterns, and incredibly there were only 12 UH-1 Huey helicopters in all of South Korea, meaning the U.S. Corps was not very mobile. The rank-and-file soldiers were mostly conscripts serving a 13-month tour, with most experienced officers and NCOs electing to serve in Vietnam rather than the backwater of Korea. The South Korean army, though well-led and motivated, was completely equipped with U.S. cast-off weapons and vehicles from World War II, its standard rifle being the M1 Garand. Both sides conducted raids across the border. For example, 5,300 South Korean troops were killed or taken prisoner on operations inside North Korea between 1953 and 1972. The U.S. and South Korean forces received air support from U.S. Air Force and South Korean Air Force units. And the seas around Korea were dominated by the U.S. 7th Fleet. From 1967 onwards, the UN command had beefed up the defences along the DMZ. The 1953 armistice forbade extensive fortifications, but fences and heavily armed observation posts were allowed. A killing zone was cleared in which landmines were sown and artillery and mortars pre-registered. The UN was geared up for trying to stop a full-scale North Korean invasion like that of 1950, but the new defences, which included electronics and sensors used in Vietnam, would hopefully slow down cross-border infiltrators, with a special quick reaction force of mechanised infantry, tanks and armoured cavalry ready to hunt down any incursions. To improve alertness among troops standing guard and patrolling, battalions were rotated every four months. Tit-for-tat raiding continued throughout 1966 and 1967. There were several serious border incidents in 1967, including U.S. troops, too many to discuss here. But by way of example, on the 10th of August, a 7th Infantry Division construction team from the 31st Infantry Regiment was ambushed south of the DMZ. In the firefight that followed, three U.S. soldiers were killed and 16 wounded, with one later dying of his wounds. In total, 1967 saw the deaths of 16 U.S. troops in combat in Korea. In January 1968, the Communists launched a full-scale effort to assassinate the South Korean president at his palace, the Blue House in Seoul. 
On the night of the 17th of January, a 31-man North Korean commando unit, part of Unit 24, infiltrated through the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division's lines. However, local woodcutters were briefly detained by the unit, and on their release, they informed the police. Unit 24 infiltrated into Seoul in two- to three-man cells on the 20th of January. Disguising themselves as South Korean soldiers, they were eventually stopped only 800 metres from the Blue House and identified. A gunfight erupted, a huge manhunt enacted to find the North Korean commandos who largely fought to the death. Only one made it back to North Korea, the rest being killed or captured. 26 South Korean troops died, along with four U.S. servicemen. But worse was to come for the U.S. On the 23rd of January, the USS Pueblo, a U.S. Navy surveillance ship, was attacked by North Korean Navy torpedo boats and gunboats, covered by two MiG-21 jets. It remains disputed to this day whether the Pueblo was in international or North Korean waters at the time of the attack. One U.S. sailor died, and 82 plus the ship were captured. The Pueblo is currently on display as a museum vessel in North Korea and remains a commissioned warship in the U.S. Navy. The diplomatic fallout for President Lyndon Johnson was enormous as he struggled to deal with crises in Vietnam. The president decided on a show of force and ordered a massive reinforcement of U.S. forces in Korea, including over 200 combat aircraft and six aircraft carriers. He even partially mobilized reservists back in the States, evidently expecting war with North Korea. But Johnson hoped to avoid a conflict with U.S. forces so overstretched in Vietnam and Europe, and negotiated the return of the Pueblo's crew. Indeed, the infamous Tet Offensive had opened in Vietnam on the 30th of January 1968. However, South Korean President Park wanted to invade the North and remove the threat to his nation once and for all. But by promising to modernize the South Korean armed forces, $100 million in military aid being offered by Washington initially, Park agreed not to cross the 38th parallel. The influx of U.S. military resources into South Korea actually put the North Koreans off further large-scale incursion attempts, and the dangers being faced by U.S. servicemen in protecting the border, including many small-scale contacts with North Korean troops, with casualties sustained on both sides, caused the men to become entitled to hostile fire pay and the award of the Combat Infantryman Badge and Combat Medical Badge to qualified men serving north of the Imjin River. Throughout the rest of 1968, North Korean infiltrators attack U.S. patrols and vehicles along the DMZ. These small-scale firefights cost the U.S. 22 men killed in action. This truck was not blown up in Vietnam. It was ambushed on April 1968 by North Korean communists in a flagrant daylight raid across the Korean DMZ. The three soldiers of the 2nd U.S. Infantry Division and one Katusa soldier who were murdered in this truce violation were on their way to lunch. The North now switched to trying to infiltrate South Korea from the sea rather than through the demilitarized zone. On the night of the 30th of October 1968, another unit of North Korean commandos, 120 men strong, landed at eight different locations along the coast, with orders to set up guerrilla bases in the Taebaek Mountains. Alerted by local citizens, South Korean forces hunted them for two weeks, losing 40 killed, plus 23 civilians killed or murdered by North Korean commandos. 110 North Koreans were killed and seven were captured. On the 15th of April 1969, the U.S. suffered significant losses when an American Air Force EC-121M Warning Star electronics intelligence aircraft was intercepted and shot down by two North Korean MiGs 167 kilometers off the coast. All 31 crew members were killed. President Richard Nixon considered a retaliatory airstrike against the MiG's base, but his advisers persuaded him that it might cause a full-scale war, something America could ill afford as the Vietnam War rumbled on. 
During 1969, many more small-scale infiltrations were dealt with, involving regular shootouts. As the men of the 76th Engineer Battalion began to line up for their supper, their mess tent was suddenly hit by heavy machine gun fire from communist raiders. Two U.S. soldiers, one Katusa killed. 26 other people wounded, including two Korean laundry women. This is where a barracks building stood, located at Camp Wally. It was demolished by a planted time bomb. Two soldiers were killed in their sleep. These are only a few variations on the communist theme. In total, 1969 witnessed the deaths of five U.S. soldiers in combat in Korea. On the 17th of August, a U.S. OH-23 Raven helicopter strayed across the border and was shot down. Its three crew members were prisoners of war until December. Kim Il-sung's infiltration campaign appeared to have failed by December 1969. He purged the generals responsible for the failed campaign and concentrated on building up his conventional defences. New infiltration tactics were also formulated, including tunnels dug under the DMZ. The Second Korean War cost the US 75 soldiers and airmen killed in action and a couple of hundred wounded, while South Korea lost 299 soldiers killed and 550 wounded. American soldiers would continue to be killed and wounded in the course of patrolling the border, and even in 2020, US forces still do this job alongside the South Koreans. The border, the last Cold War-style frontier left since the fall of communism in Europe. It remains a very dangerous place, where gunfire is regularly traded across no man's land, and where US soldiers will continue to serve for the foreseeable future. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. You can also visit my new audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. And help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, which is always very much appreciated.